Hello everyone, this is International Master Robert Jamison from Kids Unlimited in Melbourne, Australia. And today I might thought I might talk about, do you have what it takes to become a chess master? So most of last night I was on Reddit uh, where I was answering questions about chess. And a lot of people were asking questions like, how do they get to 2000? How do they become a chess master? Do they have a chance? They're 18 years old and they're rated 1700 or something like that. Can they make it to becoming a chess master? So I thought we'd have a chat about what it takes to become a master. And uh, I'll tell you a few stories about my experiences with some of our better juniors here in Australia. Uh, so many years ago, uh, probably 1975-ish, uh, I was reading a chess column from uh, Leonard Barden, the famous British columnist, I think it's in the Spectator or Evening Standard or both, uh, where he showed a game from a 10-year-old uh, boy from Azerbaijan called Gary Weinstein. And Barden pondered whether or not in 10 or 15 years time, perhaps this boy would be the world chess champion. Now, that's a pretty big call for a 10 years old. So what was it about Gary Weinstein that made Leonard Barden think he had the possibilities to be a world champion? All right, the most obvious thing is that he was pretty young and he was extremely good for his age. So for a 10 year old, he had a, a really high rating. If you think back in the history of the world champions, uh, a lot of them have been chess prodigies. So people like uh, Morphy and Capablanca learn the game at four, or Bobby Fischer at six, and they're really strong as a young player. So the first thing you think about if you want to become a chess master is how old are you? So the younger, the better, because you can improve more readily when you're young. And what is your playing strength? So if you are really strong for your age, perhaps you can improve rapidly as a young player and get up to the lofty heights of being a master or grandmaster. Okay. What else? Um, I can remember back to uh, 1973, to the Australian Open Championship played here in Melbourne, and I think we had about 120 players or so. Now, in those days, uh, juniors didn't really play in adult tournaments, particularly young juniors. It wasn't really heard of. And I remember uh, overhearing a conversation halfway through the tournament where one of the players was bemoaning to the arbiter. He was saying, oh, I'm having a really bad tournament. I, I haven't won a game yet. I, you know, I, I don't think I'm ever going to win a game in this tournament. And the arbiter tried to console him and said, look, don't worry, don't worry. Next round, I have paired you with a 12-year-old boy. So, of course, surely the adult player would win. And uh, they played. And what happened? That 12-year-old boy won. His name was Ian Rogers, who now, of course, is Grandmaster Ian Rogers. So what was he doing as a 12-year-old playing in an adult Australian Open Championship? This is another thing to consider if you want to become a really strong player. You are competing with your rivals. There might be other really good, talented 12-year-old chess players who are keen on becoming a master and you will be the one who gets ahead if you do more than them, if you do something different, better than them. So if you're Ian Rogers playing in the Australian Open, clearly you're going to get better experience than 12-year-old Fred Nurk playing in the Victorian Junior, for instance. Okay, so you have to do more than your competitors. I think it was um, Thomas Edison, the inventor, who said something along the lines of, um, my success is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. So he put a lot of work into his inventions, clearly. Okay, now, another factor to bear in mind is 
think of the envir environment in which you are playing. Is it a, a good environment that uh, is conducive to improving? So what you really want is firstly some rivals. So if you've got some young kids your age, your standard, if you can get together and compete with each other, help each other, egg each other on, a little bit of a friendship group, then you've got a good thing going for setting up a situation where you can improve rapidly. And this is in fact what we did here in Victoria in the 1970s. In the mid 70s, uh, I was running the Junior Chess League. So we started a junior training squad. So we got the best, most promising kids in Victoria, brought them together. I gave them lectures and lessons and games and so on. And uh, from that squad, uh, we got five title players, two grandmasters and three international masters because they were together learning from the best player in the country and competing against each other. Uh, I remember one of the questions I asked this squad was, um, how many chess books do you have? So there was a kid at the front and he said, oh, I've got a couple of chess books. And another boy said, oh, I've got, I've got five books. And there was a 12 year old boy who said, oh, I've got 10 books. His name was Greg Yorth and he went on to become an IM, quite a strong IM, of course. Then there was a little short Jewish boy at the back who I think was about 15. And he said, I've got a hundred books. His name was Ian Rogers. So who from that group did more than the others? Who had read a hundred books for all their rivals that only read 10? Ian Rogers. So he went on to become the best player from that group. Okay, so we have to compete against our rivals and do more than them. Now, uh, another factor, uh, a lot of strong players uh, go through a period in their life, perhaps in their teenage years, where they're more or less obsessed with chess. And that concentration on chess in that period gives them a chance to improve rapidly. Um, I know in my case, for instance, uh, I was obsessed with chess books. I would buy every chess book I could find that I didn't have. I'd go to antique shops and buy old books. Uh, and I love collecting chess books. They smell really nice, all that old musky spell, for instance. Uh, I subscribed to heaps of magazines. When I was at uni at Monash University, uh, I would go to the library and photocopy all the chess columns, Leonard Barden's chess column, and chess columns in the Israeli Times and all over the place. So I would read all the latest news and games and so on. And during lunchtime, of course, uh, we had a very fortunate, we had a, a room, a chess room that we could play in all day if we wanted. So whenever I was in a lecture, I was in the chess club playing lightning chess. I remember uh, when I first got to uni, the uh, club champion was a guy called Robin Hill. So I challenged him to a lightning match and we played best of a thousand games. We play 10 or 20 games each day and put the result up on the board and see who won. So I was pretty obsessed with chess in those days and I improved a lot in that period. Okay, uh, what else can I do? All right, let's go back to considering the environment you are in. So I presume you've heard about ponds. So are you a big fish in a little pond or are you a little fish in a big pond, because this is very important. If you're 1800 player and you're going to a chess club and the best player in that club is 2000, you're going to struggle to get beyond 2000 because you can't learn against much stronger opponents. If you go to a club and the best player is 2600, of course you have much better possibilities. I know in my day, um, I ran a chess club called the Waverley Chess Club. Uh, and a lot of the top juniors ended up going to Waverley and playing at Waverley because if you went to that club, you had the Australian champion there. Uh, Waverley won the A grade inter club competition. We had a lot of strong players. So the sky was the limit. You could improve as much as you could. The alternative 
was to go to a club down the road called Box Hill Chess Club, which uh, met in a, an old tennis club and was basically a club of old men where the top player was about 2,000. Of course, Waverley is now dead and gone and Box Hill is still thriving and is a much stronger chess club with a lot of juniors. So they won out in the long run, but in the 70s and 80s, if you wanted to improve, clearly you go to a big pond and try and grow into a big fish in that pond. Uh, one of the questions I got on Reddit quite a bit was, um, Robert, uh, why, why didn't you ever become a grandmaster? Didn't you want to become a grandmaster and stuff in the, in the early days? And the problem for me was Australia was a very small chess pond in those days. So our top players, um, Max Fuller, Doug Hamilton, Trevor Hay and so on, they'd be like 2,350 or 70 or 90 rating, the low two, 300s, and they weren't even IMs. And the whole country, we didn't have any GMs at all. So how on earth can you become a grandmaster when you have no grandmasters to play against or learn from? If you were lucky, uh, every two years, you might go to the Chess Olympiad and play a, a handful of grandmasters there. And that was certainly great. But if the pond in Australia, the top players are 2390, um, what are you going to do? So in my case, I tried really hard and I pushed the top up a bit. I got to the low 2400s and I got the IM title. So if people wanted to be the best in Australia, they had to be better than me. They had to then be an IM or in the case of Ian Rogers and Daryl, they moved the, bar, uh, the top of the mountain up a bit higher, they became GMs. So consider the pond you're in. So in terms of your playing opportunities, uh, you should be playing in tournaments where there are stronger players, not necessarily players who will absolutely crush you because you haven't got a hope on their grandmaster and your 1200 or something, but players who are better than you, who you can learn from, and have postmortems after and uh, perhaps improve towards their level. Okay. Um, I think that's all I need to tell you about the environment for becoming a strong player. So let's have a little test. Do you have what it takes to become a master? I have a position on the board, which you might have seen already, from the World Championship match between Max Erver and Alexander Alakine back in the late 1930s. I remember I actually played Max Erver uh, in 1977, I think it was. He came to Australia and I played in a similar against him. Uh, one of our best juniors was sitting on my left and another one of our best juniors was sitting on my right. So I helped them as much as I could. And the end result was in the simul, the junior on my left beat the world champion, Max Server. The junior on my right beat the world champion, Max Server, And I lost. But I can say I played him. He was a very fine old gentleman. Anyway, let's get back to the chess content for today. So here is a position. Material is equal. It's white to play. Uh, I'd like you to put your thinking cap on and decide what move you would play as white. You might like to pause the video and give it five minutes thought or so and see what you can come up with. So if that's the case, pause the video now. All right, have you decided? Now, I just gave this position to a couple of my students and their approach was as follows. The first student started to analyze. He thought, right, white, what can I do? What can I do? Oh, here's a sneaky move. I can play bishop c6. Taking the bishop. So my opponent will take. I will take. Maybe he'll play pawn here. And I've got the active rook. And he's got double pawns. You know, maybe I can win this end game. This could be a better end game for me. All right. Well, I said that's uh, an interesting idea. But a couple of points. So first point, bishop here, takes, takes. So what instead of defending the pawn or moving the pawn, uh, what if he activates his rook? What if he plays rook here? 
and you take, he goes rook here. Now he's going to take, he's going to have a pass pawn. It's going to be pretty hard for you to win. I'd say, you know, he's got, black's got active rook, pretty clear to be a draw. I also said, when he plays here, maybe you've missed a tactic. Can you see it? What would black play? We looked at rook takes bishop and the consequences of that. So my student looked for a second and he found it. Black would probably play this move. Extra sneaky move, disclosing an attack on the rook. So white will probably have to swap now. And the bishop endgame is a lot better for black than a rook endgame. Black's got this outside pass pawn and his pawns are on the opposite color to his bishop. So I don't think black would have too much trouble here. All right, so that was my first student's approach to the position. He, he analyzed, looked for things he could threaten. All right, my second student looked at these moves as well and then decided he didn't like that much. So he thought, okay, I have a pass pawn, so my move is going to be e4. I'm going to try and do something with this pass pawn. That's a reasonable idea, but not the move played by Max Erber. Right. So, did you guys get a different move? Let me explain. So, the thing my students were doing wrong is they were analyzing and focusing on what they wanted to do. In a situation like this, what you should do is try and understand what's happening in the position. And part of that understanding is looking at what your opponent is trying to do. Not just what you want to do, but what your opponent is trying to do. So for instance, if it was Black's go here, what would he play? The answer is, he would probably play this sneaky move and try and get the exchange of rooks as we looked at before. All right, let's look at it from White's point of view. So it's true, White does have a pass pawn, Black has a double pawn, White has a nice bishop. You'd think it's probably going to be better for White. And you should hopefully realize that Black has this problem at the moment that the bishop and the rook are a bit tied down to each other. So your brain should be thinking, well, I'd like to keep that bishop and that rook tied down with not much to do. But the problem that I've just identified is he's going to play bishop here and get out of the pin. All right, can I solve that problem? So that's the thinking process. So if you were Max Server, now that I've given you these hints, can you solve that problem? All right. So the move that White played is this fantastic move, rook a2. Why is this such a fantastic move? Because it deprives Black of the defense, bishop b5, because now we just take the bishop and our rook is defended by our bishop. So now he can't move the bishop because the rook would be on pre. He can't move the rook because the bishop would be on pre. So he's all tied up. So this is fantastic. This is what we want in in-game. We want a position where our opponent doesn't have much to do and we can improve our position. So uh, if black can't do much, white's probably going to follow up f3, e4, move his king into the middle, e5, f4, king up. So he's going to improve his position. Then he will do something about uh, putting his opponent under pressure and attacking him, move his rook somewhere, and it's better for white. And in fact, I think white went on to win the game. But I doubt that he would have won unless he found this fantastic move, rook a2. So if you've too found it, perhaps you too have the potential to become a master. Good luck. See you in the next video.